This is Bud Carey, and tonight is our very special program, helping Mr. Richard Tucker to celebrate his 25 years at the Metropolitan Opera. But my special thrill is that he's here with us to do it. Welcome, Mr. Tucker. Thank you, Bud. Always a pleasure. It's very rare, though, that I come back to San Francisco, but I look forward to returning soon. Program on the Chicago Theater of the Air, believe it or not, and it featured Carmen with you as Don Jose. God, that really goes back a long time. Yeah, it does go back, and I uh, had on at that time Sandra Gare, who was oh, the yes. actor, uh, actress on that. That's program. correct. And Where is Sandra today? Well, she was here in San Francisco until very recently. She's just moved to L.A., Los Angeles. I shouldn't oh, abbreviate it. Yes. People get upset about that. And she spoke very warmly. Yes, yeah, she was. She's a wonderful, warm person. I remember her very well from the Chicago Theater of the Year. In fact, uh, apropos, we, uh, whenever we visit Miami, uh, when I sing there with the Miami Opera Guild, uh, we always hear from our uh, music director and his dear wife, Henry Weber and Marion. Oh, yes. yes, they live now in Fort Lauderdale. Right. And yes. uh, we see, I speak to them, and we see them very, very rarely, but we keep up the friendship between us. She doesn't work anymore. No, no, no. They're both retired. Oh, they both are. Well, I'm I, sort of the old man now today in my field of opera because these people have retired and naturally today I'm sort of the oldest member. You know, at the ripe old age of 54, you know, you're an old man. <laughs> well, I guess some of the kids feel that way, but by golly, there's something to say about experience. You know? Well, that's, um, that's, another, that's another subject. <laughs> All right, we won't even bother with it then. Oh, yes, we can talk about that later. All right. I'm going to play next my favorite recording of yours, and then I want you to tell me a little bit about it, the Apri la Tua Finestra from Iris. That's a beautiful aria. I had the joy to record that, uh, conducted by my dear friend, uh, Maestro Fausto Claver, who was here yes. many years ago at the San Francisco Opera. And to me, today, uh, I consider him the finest Italian conductor of the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, this is uh, a very, very enjoyable uh, recording session for my Puccini arias, and uh, I'm always looking, as you notice my albums, I don't remain stagnant. I don't sing only the popular arias. No, well, that's good. I always am searching to bring in arias which are not done, of course, from the commercial point of view. You know, the uh, artists don't like to record things that are not heard of very often, but I always like to include uh, things that have not been done, revive them, combine it with more popular areas, so it'll give the record by them more of a diversity. Diver diversification. Sure, sure. I think the sales record sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen the opera, uh, Iris, but uh, I hear there's some beautiful music, well, from the aria itself, you can... Uh, oh, yes. We played the entire opera in uh, June, first part of June, which was a broadcast from Holland with Magda Oliveira, which you've probably yes. been reading about. Yes. And uh, the, the mail has been tremendous. I couldn't believe people would really want to hear something besides Cavalleria Rusticana. Well, the unfortunate part of it is we always speak about that in the Metropolitan, and uh, this is one of the reasons why operas like Yuri's are never performed in this country, because we have no subsidization by the government in our arts, and uh, if we were to play operas like this, in the Metropolitan Opera House, as I have seen it in Europe, where the, the uh, opera, for instance, by uh, Wolf Ferrari or by uh, Pizzetti, uh, there were no more than 400 people at the Teatro dell'Opera. But Rome. that doesn't matter there because they have the government. They have the government. Now, how sure. can you play an opera like yours if you want to sell four or 500 seats? Uh, to, a, to a capacity of 35, 3,800 people. That's right. You Who's going to put the bill? Fee. That's right. <laughs> That's, yeah, very, very true. Tell me about some of your experience with the great maestro Toscanini. Oh, that, that's what we call another world. That is, yes. Well, I, I think particularly of the AIDA broadcast that you did. This is one of the great ones that I remember. Yes. It was a very great experience, especially when I met the maestro. Rest of soul is... Uh, he asked me, first of all, I didn't even know the aria Celeste either. And uh, I asked him if I could please read it. And he said, by all means, go right ahead. Then when I got through singing it, he said, how is it that you don't sing Aida and you sang La Giaconda? Both, of course, being in the dramatic vein of singing. I said to him, uh, because the good Lord was good to me, 
That doesn't mean I have to break the screen. <laughs> he looked up to me and he said, a tenor with brains? That's impossible. <laughs> you see, this is where they get the old sayings from. And after I got through uh, with the rendition of Chiles Aida, he just left the studio and said two words, Bella Voce, which means beautiful voice. And the next morning, uh, Mr. Samuel Schwarzenegger, who was at that time the NBC director of music, called me and he said, Richard, you are in for the role of Radames. And, of course, you can imagine how my wife and I felt about that, being chosen. Like, you really say from from a studio, although I made my debut at the Metropolitan, uh, right to the uh, pinnacle of, of uh, musical achievement. Oh, yeah. Because the with Toscanini was a musical achievement. Well, and the whole world picked up on that. Yeah, well, it was the first telecast in the world, and I still get a kick of seeing it and hearing uh, my voice. You know, the difference between 1949 oh, yeah. and today, you know, uh, when we uh, listen and, and uh, see the uh, film of the... Uh, oh, they film it? Yes, it's in the archives. Oh, very yes, good. Yes, New York. I've always been curious about the ending of the Chalex Chaida. Well, that's been spoken about so many times throughout... You're the, probably sick of hearing No, it, I'm sure. not sick. I'd like to explain it because uh, people... I knew what was going to happen. You see, and that's the reason why you know, somewhere in my home, it's buried somewhere, is the letter which uh, Maestro Toscanini gave me from Giuseppe Verdi, showing how he made at the last moment this transition because the tenor wanted to cancel the performance and they had nobody to replace him. Uh -huh. So Maestro Verdi went into the dressing room. This was at the premiere of Aida. And. Uh, the was, Prima, huh? The premiere was in Cairo, yes, you know, I know, because it was written, you know, for... Opening of the Suez Tank. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what happened was, uh, in order to uh, rectify and uh, to calm the tent down, uh, so he continued the performance, because you can't ship over a tent of a mystery <laughs> in the last minute of Cairo, you know. Yeah, I guess not. So uh, he said, just hit the high note and come down into a canyon tomorrow and I will bring up the celli to play the melody. And this is what That's happened. That's how it started. And although what I was surprised at, although I knew what was going to happen eventually to me, because I received hundreds of phone calls from all over the country, letters. You cheated. They didn't say cheated. They said, <laughs> Richard, what happened? They thought I was sick. Oh, really? See? Oh. But, but the surprise that I want to give to your listeners is that this was never written in the original partitura. You see, and this is what made me a little uh, surprised. Mm -hmm. Why did the maestro Verdi put it in as an option? As an option, yes. You see, and this is what happened. That's the story of the B flat. But uh, sometimes I think it with a lot of uh, maestros throughout the world, and uh, they said, Richard, would you please uh, sing the original uh, Verdi ending? Meaning the pianissimo. Yeah, you hit the B flat, and mm -hmm. you come down, and you the piano so B flat uh, not to roll. You know. I comply, I don't mind it, but the shirt see people in general are used to the bombastic ending. Which you know all so on the B Which flat. is what they expect yes, anymore, sure. Sure. So that's the story with the Tuscan in the ending of the low B flat. Oh, well, that's a wonderful story. Did you feel at that time that uh, vocally you weren't ready to assume that role on stage? Oh definitely. That's why I waited twenty years to do it. Yes I know, it's just a recent thing, isn't it? Oh yeah. In fact, my debut even last season in Pagliacci was 25 years late. But you had recorded it earlier. Recordings have nothing to do with stage, and this is what I try to tell young singers. This is why they shoot all, what we call shoot all their little cannonballs in five years, mm -hmm. and they're finished. This is what I wanted to ask you about. Do you think younger singers do it too fast these days? Definitely, definitely. They have no patience. Everyone's an eager beaver, like a little coat out of a starting gate, and they want to do a mile and an eighth when they can't even run 100 yards. But, uh, I know particularly what your feelings are about this next question, but I want to hear you say it so our listeners will know for sure. You've been compared with Caruso, and I don't believe you you like that as much as people would think you would. Well, that's true, Bert, because uh, I've always built my career on the voice of Richard Tucker. I'm always happy when people are reminded of the greats of yesteryear. 
because this is something of a gift that when a person goes to a concert hall or an opera house and is reminded by a certain singer of a certain singer in the so-called golden age of singing, I think that in itself is a compliment. But to sing like Caruso or to sing like Benjamino Gini, I have never sung like anyone but Richard Tucker because I think the worst thing in the world for any singer is to impersonate another. And the baritones, as you know, they have been crucified. They have, they have lost their voices because they try to imitate uh, Scott Hutt, and they try to imitate uh, John Charles Thomas. And they couldn't only because their, their throats were open. That's right. You see? And you're not allowed to sing open too much. Not anymore, that's true. Isn't no. It? Well, vocally, it's very bad. Well, now I think the younger breed do try to emulate Leonard Warren, one of your colleagues. Well, I haven't heard any of them, but uh, this is what I try to convey to most of my young people that I have the opportunity to audition when I visit universities or visit a city where I stay more than a day or two. One of my earliest recollections of the Tucker voice was from a live broadcast from the Metropolitan of Rigoletto. And so we will hear from that. I, I look forward to the day when I will start retiring and I don't know what field I'm going to go into, either a teaching or direction, because with my experience that I've had in 25 years at the Metropolitan Opera, with the world's greatest stage directors, it's somehow a shame to me, although, you know, I'm sure my wife will agree, she say, leave the stage directing, like Hurt says, leave the driving to us, you stick to teaching and singing, you know? Sure. But it's only because there are, are so few good directors for opera. Say, for yeah. opera. Yeah. And I believe me, with, without saying anything uh, detriment to them, some of these opera directors are really from out in left field. I don't really know if they studied the score well enough. Well, not just the score, but you know, sometimes the words. I can cite you well, some well, beautiful the score, I mean the right words. Here. Oh, you know, boy. Yeah. Now, uh, everyone tries to modernize. We're living in an age, of course, of modernization today. Well, that works sometimes. It, it does, but believe me when I tell you, uh, here, I just returned from Rome. Well, you probably read about the miniskirted car. Yes, yes. <laughs> now, uh... I'm opposed to that. So well, no. You see, I'm I'm for reform with limitations. Yes, but what Richard has but happened to taste? That's something else. You see, in order, they say, in order to draw in the people, you've got to have something extraordinary, extra extraordinary. Well, what is happening? Is the scenery going to sing? Exactly. You see, this is one of... Or are the costumes. <laughs> are the costumes going to sing? Yeah. Or is the orchestra going to sing? you got to have voices. Well, if you're not interested in voices, that means you're not interested in stars. And if you're not interested in stars, how in heaven's name are you going to draw the people who attend to a full house of concerts? No, I will maintain for the rest of my life, which I hope there's plenty of yet to come, that people go to hear the singers. Oh, yes. A I good I'll conductor will always stand out, but the singers are the focal point. I will buy that, bud. Yeah, that's, that's my feeling. I, I'm so tired of conductors who drown out singers and all of this kind of thing. We pay tremendous prices for opera these days, and I want to hear the singing. Oh, the students are singing. It's so true. And yeah, I really feel that way. Tell me, do you have any favorite ladies and favorite memories of favorite ladies? Oh, I have very, very many memories of uh, past and present ladies. I've sung, after all, as you know, probably read with the greatest of prima donnas. Yes, I know. From uh, Zinka Milanov uh, on to uh, present with Lee Chalbanese, of course, and a uh, great favorite here in San Francisco. Well, many, and many Dorothy years. Kirsten, and today with Renata Tabaldi, with Joan Sutherland, with Leontine Price, Anna Muffo, to name a few, and now with Miss Martina Arroyo. Uh, I've sung with them all. What? Maria Callas, of course, I should have mentioned. That should have been an experience. Okay, you have it any was. memory of that that you could tell me? Yes, we uh, well, as you know, you know, Maria and I made our debut together in uh, Verona. No, I didn't know. Not many people know about it because she never had the nerve to mention it in her book. <laughs> yes. Just said a tenor made us also a success in Verona without mentioning my name. At all? At all. See, I read that and I passed right over that. Well, I didn't well, know. Well, naturally, because nobody ever knew it was me. And I held her up for two acts at 240 pounds. <laughs> she weighed 240 pounds at that time. So, uh, I wanted to ask you about that. The, uh, with not just Maria particularly, uh, there are many singers who have come and gone. Voices lasted maybe a year or maybe longer. But it seems like when they started glamorizing themselves, slimming down, the voice went too. Do you believe this? Oh, happened? definitely so. I'm I'm against uh, losing 
too much weight because uh, you know it's the old joke you you see a, you don't see a person for a long time and the next time you see them you know they're very very uh, tired looking and drawn shows in the face yeah. uh, and and you say how do you feel and they said great and a few weeks later you hear they're in the hospital mm -hmm. you see so vocally I've always uh, maintained that you can lose so much weight and no more especially if you're a singer of my type that is, sings the lyric spinto roles where you need guts that's why they call me the blood and guts singer the metropolitan opera because I can't stand still when I sing opera because I convey the character and the meaning of the words with the music so I can't sing like a duck and I've got <laughs> to have what we call uh, plenty of muscle and a little weight not too much weight same with a singer as we see today many of our Big time prima donnas are, are slimming down. It's not like compared with the years before, with the 250 pounds. No, uh, that's right. Today, people want to see somebody as beautiful as she sounds. I don't know, though, Richard. I think the real opera lover, in spite of all the glamour that's come into it, well, glamour was always in it, I guess, but more so now, it seems to me that the real opera lover still wants a good voice, regardless of it doesn't look good on yes me. but uh, having a beautiful voice is one thing today but i think the women in general today feel that uh, they can't get too far unless they are at least a 16 size 16. well i think the managers have pushed that idea but i think the well, public still television is coming that's why oh tv yes sure. see that's helped tremendously sure and now one of the neapolitan songs Did you ever really think you'd reach the status during those days of your early career, Chicago theater and all that, of being called America's greatest tenor? Oh, yes. I was working along those lines. I would be, uh, don't think I'm egotistical when I say that, but uh, being a perfectionist, I only wanted to be the best. If I couldn't be the best, I would have quit. Really? Yeah. Well, you've got so much more drive and ambition than I would ever have, I must say. Well, this, uh, <laughs> this is the way I've always been, you see. I never wanted, especially having a wife like I have, you understand, we never accepted second best in our family. Well, that's perfect. It's wonderful. Well, that's I, why, that, I must say this, but that's why when Richard Tucker doesn't sound like Richard Tucker should sound, it's my done. wife is going to be the first one to tell me to quit. Oh, that's so good. You see, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, what we call continue on, unfortunately, as some of my colleagues are doing. No, that's you right. No. And have people talk behind our backs and saying, I remember him when. That's all right, and it damages a career that we could well be left to good memory. I think it's because a lot of colleagues of mine like to hear the old world applause. Well, sure, really more than money, that's the real payment at times to, to some of these people, sure. Yeah. Do you ever cook, Richard? Cook? Yes. That's my wife's reputation, but and when you come east, you must come and visit us because my wife's reputation as a cook precedes me. What would be the, the most resounding advice you'd give a young singer today? Well, I think the basic things that uh, he should do is, are, I should say, uh, study first in the lines of very, very light bel canto singing. In other words, pursue the Mozart approach, the solfeggio, and stay away from the dramatic Puccini and Verdi operas mm. and repertoire until they mature. In other words, the best example I can give you is this. Carmen can never be Carmen at 21, as Canio can never be Canio at 24. Mm. They both must suffer. Now, when I use the word suffer, I'm not speaking in a sense that they should starve themselves to death. I'm speaking in the sense of a vocal build up. Take my career, for instance. Guidance is 50% of the battle. Whenever I was offered a role at the Metropolitan, I used to come home, discuss it with my accompanist, my coach, and my vocal teacher. And they say, leave it alone for later on, which I did. Mm -hmm. And this was 50% of the battle. Because people today ask me, why is it you waited 20 years to sing Aida? Or why is it you waited 25 years to sing Pagnacci. I said, the reason and why is your answer today. How many singers do you know today that are alive that have existed 25 years of singing with the Metropolitan Opera? Or for any one company, sure. Well, this 
I don't. The matter. Yes, the matter. I understand. You see, <laughs> or in this country. So there's your answer. Now I'm not saying that they should stay away for 25 years of certain roles, but they have to listen to someone that they have faith in, regardless if it be a uh, a vocal teacher or a musician that has the ear with which to guide that person's voice. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And that's the answer to a success. Because if they're going to shoot all their models, as I said before, in five years, for a woman by singing Leonora's and all the dramatic roles, when she's 25, she'll have nothing to offer as a tenor. When he's 21, 22, he thinks she's the greatest in the world by singing a Pagliacci. Well, if he wants to do Pagliacci, I'll give him one thing to do. Because I never knew what to do until I got on the stage last season. Let him run around the block ten times <laughs> and then sing the aria for me. Yeah. It takes that much. It takes that much. Well, God bless you. I mean, yes, I'm from, goes well. you know, when you come from Brooklyn, you know, you've got to accept everything. Well, that's really true. It seems now, uh, to me anyway, that more of your singing is in Italy than it was in the earlier part of your career. Definitely so, bud, but you see... Is there a reason for this? Very, very, very uh, simple. The uh, intrigue that went on in Italy kept me out of Italy for 20 years. Oh, it did? Yes. So now I have a new career. I commute between the United States. I go only once a year, possibly once in a while, twice a year, but once a year. I go to Italy because I haven't got the time, and I stay a month, and uh, it's a joy for an American to be invited back every season. Joy, and, different theaters. and a real flattery. I well, think. I don't want to be the one to say it, but well, I'll say uh, it. <laughs> how many singers, how many Americans sing in Italy? Yes, exactly. Germany, yes, but not Italy. Not Italy. No, not Italy. Really. Yes, I'm singing a new role next year. You should know me by now, bud. I don't sit still on my fanny. <laughs> well, I wouldn't think you would, but no. I haven't had a chance to talk to you about that. I'm doing my first Samson and Delilah next year. Oh, that's right. I did read that. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm a little remiss in no, my duty. No, but all right. <laughs> what uh, about Elijah Wee? Will you uh, ever do that at the Met? I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't like to say no, but uh, <clears throat> but I will say that uh, I would be very, very much surprised. But you never know. Well, Surprises with you are always in the air. They would offer it to you. I would think. Oh, I had more than that, but I offered Mr. Bing $150,000 for contribution to two people, and he wouldn't do it years ago. Why, because he felt it wasn't they, cost of it? No, no. He felt it was outdated music. Oh, and, good uh, God, you can name a that, thousand well, things that way. You know what I, my my uh, answer to him was? What opera do you do that's not outdated? Indeed. He said maybe but a post second. Who he goes is to the that? general manager. <laughs> he is the general manager, you know I have to abide by his decision. Oh, yeah, sure. He's the boss. That's That's all. Right. Somebody has to be. I respect his position. I respect much. him. He's done an awful lot, believe me. I hate to see him leave the Metropolitan. I wish he wouldn't. Yes, he is planning to retire. He's now, planning maybe. to retire but in 72, but I hope and pray that he'll continue on, because I think he's done a tremendous job for opera in this country. Tremendous. Do you have a favorite funny story, backstage type, that you could tell me before we close? Backstage type? Well, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm uh, literally known as the Joker at the Metropolitan Opera because I'm always uh, injecting uh, frivolities uh, during uh, rehearsals, not performances, dress rehearsals. That's Excuse me for interrupting, but do you feel it takes the, the tension off of the That's thing? the reason why I do it. Yeah, I would think But of so. course, I don't get along with the maestros for that. <laughs> because naturally, you know, they lose a little patience. Yeah, they're you know, pretty serious. You're fighting, you're fighting time, unions. Yeah. You know, we've got 16 unions at the Metropolitan Opera. Yes, I know. And you can't afford to repeat anything. So uh, I'm always uh, going around joking with uh, all the artists and take a little tension off before the uh, dress rehearsal or, or the stage rehearsal start. But I think it helps a lot. Yes, I would think so, too. So I'm going to sing in Florence next year, next December in Pagliacci, and then from there I've accepted the Italian challenge to sing in Parma. Well, God bless you. I mean, yes, I'm from, goes well. you know, when you come from Brooklyn, you know, you got it. Yes, I would think so too. Well, Richard, a very happy 25 years for the metropolitan singing you've given us. It has pleased all of us, and I'm delighted you could be here to join us. Thank you, Bud. And uh, if people didn't know it, uh, I've sung about 600 performances with the Metropolitan Opera. That's a fantastic. And I'd like to give you a little material 
which the Metropolitan gave out on my behalf, which was written by a very dear friend of mine. I'm sure you know, you've read many of his stories, Irving Kaluden. Oh, yes, indeed. And uh, so you'll be able to read up on the things that the Metropolitan has done for me. And, uh, and what have you to, done for them? I'm trying to continue to still give my best. Well, you do that. And much continued good success. Thank you very much, Bud, and hope to return to San Francisco soon. Good. was, of course, Richard Tucker closing with Giorno di Pianto from one of the... At the end of that interview, you heard me talk uh, with Mr. Tucker about some material that he gave me and uh, told me I might want to look it over. Well, I did indeed, and it's a fantastic and impressive record for any one singer to hold in any one company. I must apologize for the general quality of the interview. It was done at the St. Francis Hotel, and of course we picked up all of the cable car and street noises. Also, as a program note in the Manon Lesco duet, you heard Mr. Tucker singing with Renata Tabaldi from a 1959 performance. This is Bud Carey. I hope you enjoyed me. I hope you enjoyed Richard Tucker. And I hope that you'll join us next week when we do it again. <laughs>